Okay, so previously we motivated the definition of a vector field. So let's just go through that one more time really quickly. So in calculus one and two, you're dealing with functions of one variable and they're scalar functions of one variable. So the domain is one dimensional and the range or the codomain is also one dimensional. So far in calculus three, we've looked at vector valued functions which have a scalar input. So they're vector valued functions of one variable like parameterizations of lines and curves are good examples of that. Or we have looked at scalar valued functions of multiple variables. So when we looked at that, we had like partial derivatives, multiple integrals, and so on and so forth. And a vector field in Rn can be defined as a function from Rn to Rn. So every element um, of Rn can be plugged into this vector field and that will give you a vector in Rn. So in a previous video we looked at some graphical representations of these things. We're not going to do that here. And then the next thing is a gradient or conservative vector field is one that is produced by taking the gradient of a multivariable function. Okay, so I want to start this video off with the following theorem that says the potential function of a conservative vector field is unique, and I've left a phrase off here, it's unique up to a constant on an open connected domain. So let's recall that the potential function is that special function that when you take the gradient, you produce this vector field. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and look at the proof of this theorem. And maybe, actually, before we look at the proof of this theorem, let's look at the analog of this in Calculus 1. So the analog in this of Calculus 1 would be the antiderivative of a function is unique up to a constant, which is why whenever you take an antiderivative, you put plus c or plus the constant. And you can think of finding the potential function is doing the opposite of this gradient, but this gradient is just a special type of derivative that you can do to a multivariate variable function. Um, okay, good. So now that we have that out of the way, we can uh, do our proof. So uh, let's go ahead and suppose that f and g are invariable functions such that um, the gradient of little f equals some vector field. So in other words, it is the potential function for some vector field, but the gradient of g is also the potential uh, function for the same vector field. So in other words, we're starting with, well, maybe this is not true. Maybe we have multiple potential functions for the same vector field. Okay, so uh, notice that like very clearly um, gives us the equation, uh, which is the gradient of f minus the gradient of g equals zero, and I should be putting here the zero vector, but now we have um, some linearity of the gradient operator, um, so that's going to give us the gradient of f minus g is equal to the zero vector. But let's go ahead and recall what the gradient of f minus g is. That's going to be this n-dimensional uh, vector given by um, fx1 minus gx1, um, fx2 minus gx2, and so on and so forth. So uh, fxn minus gxn, where... Um, by the subscripts, I mean taking the derivatives with respect to those certain uh, variables. Okay, good. So, notice that's going to give us uh, n equations, which I'll write like this. So that means fxi minus gxi, which is the same thing as the partial with respect to xi of the function f minus g is equal to zero, and that's got to be true for all i between one and n, because we know that this vector is identically the zero vector. Okay, so from here what it means is that f minus g uh, does not depend on xi, and that's going to be for all i between 1 and n.
Okay, good. And so, well, think about it. We have uh, the derivative with respect to x1 of f minus g equals zero. So that means f minus g doesn't depend on x1. But then we can say that for everything. So f minus g doesn't depend on x2. It doesn't depend on x3. It doesn't depend on x4 and so on and so forth. So after all that is said and done, that means f minus g doesn't depend on any of the variables. In other words, f minus g equals c, a constant. Good, but uh, that's exactly what we wanted because now we have f equals g uh, plus this constant. In other words, our potential functions are the same up to addition of a constant. Okay, and so now where did we use this fact that we have an open connected domain? Well, the openness is important because whenever we're talking about our derivative, we don't really want to consider the boundary of a set for the derivative because we need a two-sided limit. Um, or, you know, for multivariable functions, it's a limit from all directions. And then what about the connectedness? Well, let's say uh, this is a picture of Rn, and let's say we have a disconnected domain. So we have one spot over here, which we could call D1, and we could have one spot over here, which we could call D2. Well, it turns out that if you have this rule that f minus g is a constant, it could take on two different constant values, um, one for d1 and one for d2, um, if you had a disconnected domain. And so you would not have this rule that they differ by a constant. In other words, you have uniqueness up to a constant. You would have uniqueness up to these two constants depending on these two disconnected components. And you could maybe generalize this to m disconnected components and they would differ by a constant on each of the m disconnected components. Um, okay, great. So we've got uniqueness of a potential function which is like uniqueness of an antiderivative with respect to this um, gradient operator. So I'm going to clean up the board and then we're going to look at another result uh, involving conservative vector fields. Okay, so next we're going to look at the following result. So let's suppose that f is a conservative vector field. Then in R2 we have the following rule. So if f is defined to be the vector field with component functions p and q, those are functions of x and y, then dp dy, and I should say partial p partial y is the same thing as partial q partial x. Furthermore, in R3, if f is equal to p, q, r, so those are our component functions where they're functions of x, y, and z, then we have uh, dp, dy equals dq, dx, partial q, partial z is partial r, partial y, and then finally, partial r, partial x is partial p, partial z. Okay, and you might say, well, what's going on in Rn, and, well, I have some good news news for you. Once I'm done with this vector calculus stuff which makes up the standard course material for a multivariable calculus class or a calculus 3 class, I'm going to add some videos of quote unquote bonus material which pushes this all into Rn. And so I'm pretty excited to make those videos and so we'll be looking at a lot of the ideas we've looked at in this series but in more generality then. Um, so you can wait until until then for that. Okay, great. So uh, now I'm going to go ahead and prove this third one because the second one is actually a special case of this third one. So notice if we take the third one and then we assume that r is equal to the zero function and then p and q only depend on x and y, then notice r is equal to the zero function makes this zero. If q doesn't depend on z, then this is all already zero, so that applies. And then again, r is the zero function, p only depends on x and y, so this is zero. So those second two equations are trivial in this case. So this first bullet point will follow from this second bullet point. Okay, great.
So here's how we're going to do this. So let's suppose we've got a potential function. So remember a conservative vector field has a potential function. Um, so let's go ahead and suppose f, which is a function from r3 to r. In other words, it's a function of three variables. x, y, and z is what we'll call those variables, such that the gradient of little f is equal to capital F. Okay, so notice the gradient of little f is the vector field made up of the partial derivatives um, f sub x, f sub y, and f sub z, but then uh, the vector field capital F is this thing p, q, r. So we've got that going on. And so now notice that we have uh, f sub x um, is going to be equal to p, okay? And then next, uh, we're going to have uh, f sub y is going to be equal to q, and then finally f sub z is going to be equal to r. Now, uh, let's go ahead and look at uh, each of these equations. So let's look at partial p, partial y. So notice that partial p, partial y uh, will be equal to the partial with respect to y of f sub x. But the partial with respect to y of f sub x, you know, that's often written as f x y. But then by Clairaut's theorem, in other words, that theorem that says uh, that we can switch the order of partial derivatives. And I should have put a hypothesis up here in this theorem that's, that uh, covers uh, that case. And what we need is... Um, sort of a connected open set where all of the second partials are continuous. So I'll let you guys look at a textbook or look at some online resource to get the um, precise statement of this. But the details that are missing are that we need an open set that is connected um, and the second partials are all continuous on this open set. Okay, good. So then this is going to be the same thing as f y x. Great, uh, but that is the same thing as the partial with respect to x of f sub y, but that's the same thing as the partial of q with respect to x because we know f sub y is equal to q. Okay, so that proves this first equation. Now, I'm going to go ahead and prove the second one, and I think that'll probably be enough because all of these are super similar. So let's look at a partial of Q with respect to Z. So that's going to be the, the partial with respect to Z of Q, but Q is F sub Y by our assumption that this is the potential function. So we have F sub Y. So that's going to be the same thing as F Y Z. Okay, but we can switch the order, so that's f, z, y, but that's going to be the same thing as the partial with respect to y of f, z, but f, z is equal to r, so that's going to be the same thing as the partial of r with respect to y, which is exactly what we want it to be. So that proves this second equation. And then the third equation is going to go in a very, very similar way, so I urge you to work out the details just to see how it goes. Um, okay, good. This is a good place to stop this video.